Hello, and welcome to episode 12 of Dark Matter Knits. The episode title today is Re-Entry. It's July 25th, 2014, and I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman. It's been a while. Uh, more about that in a minute. I um, want to make sure to, rem to remember to tell you that you can find me online at darkmatterknits.com, and I am Elizabeth GM on Ravelry and Dark Matter Knits on Twitter and Instagram. So hi, how are you? If you are not a subscriber on YouTube, you haven't seen me in a really long time. If you are a subscriber on YouTube, it's been a while, but not quite as long. So while we're talking about business, let me just uh, clear that things up a little bit about where things have been posted and why I've been gone so long. Uh, as you probably know, if you've been watching any of the episodes before this, I was away on a long trip to Europe, a five-week trip, and I did record some what I called video postcards while I was there, uh, but it was really impossible to, well, not literally impossible, but next to impossible to post them to iTunes while I was there, because I just didn't have a good enough Wi-Fi connection to be able to do that. So I did post them to YouTube because that was easier. I don't have to compress the video, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can find both, I think it's three video postcards there, and also um, a episode 11. So if you're wondering why we skipped from 10 to 12, that's why. Episode 11 is just on YouTube. Um, I did say in episode 11 that I was only going to post to YouTube from now on. I've had a rethink. I will keep posting to iTunes for now. I know that a lot of people rely on it. I do too, honestly. I like watching podcasts through an iTunes, iTunes subscription. Um, it's just a real pain for me. And the, here's part of the problem. Um, I have to condense in order to be able to get the video up in the way that is most convenient and affordable for me. I have to condense the video down, which means losing a lot of video quality. And a couple of you have mentioned to me that the video quality is not what you would like. Honestly, it's not what I would like either. But um, it's the best I can do under the circumstances. I don't have a blog where I can fiddle with code. So thank you for those of you who told me about Stockinet Zombie's very helpful tutorial about how to um, upload video onto your own blog, but I just don't have the kind of blog that would allow me to do that. Um, I don't have the money to be able to afford a really good podcast uploader, and y'all want to watch it through iTunes, or a lot of you do, so that means condensing it down. And um, if you want better video quality, subscribe on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel over there, it's under Dark Matter Knits, and I don't condense the video there at all. So there's an option for you if, if you'd like to watch it over there. Um, so enough about that. I uh, also, while we're talking about business, I have a, a number of people to thank for leaving reviews on iTunes. Um, so many, here they are. Uh, Click Clark, LK Memphis, Suzeko One, Kagi TM, Fish Girl 182, Chankwa 2 Gen, Sync 2 Gen, I think. Jewels 999, MMMLNJ. I'll bet you live in New Jersey. <laughs> Crazy Knitting Fool, Esther 49, and Sue in upstate New York. I'll bet you live in upstate New York. <laughs> Thank you so much for your reviews and your really helpful feedback. A lot of you um, gave very specific comments about what you like and, and sometimes, you know, wish could improve about the podcast. And I just, I really appreciate that feedback. It's, um, it's most helpful. And I noticed that a lot of you who posted reviews are, are people who post reviews for other podcasts. And um, it's just really, really kind of you to take the time to support the podcast that you watch. So today's theme re-entry, which as you can probably guess has to do with the fact that uh, I just got back into the country on Wednesday of this past week and, oh no, wait a minute, is that right? No, sorry, Wednesday of the previous week, so not this past Wednesday, but so I've been home for a little more than a week and I'm still kind of reeling from it, honestly. I mean, we were, my husband was actually out of the country for two months 
and my son and I were there for five weeks. So it was quite a long time and, um, and such a luxury to be able to spend that kind of time there. So just to give you a little bit of a, a rundown of where we were, um, we spent three weeks in Angers, which is about two hours west of Paris. It's a lovely little town. Well, it's not that little. It's about 60,000 people, maybe. Um, it's about two hours west of Paris. Did I say that? And um, it it's beautiful. I mean, it has a, a 14th century chateau, um, you know, some timber houses from the same era, you know, Tudor houses in England, those, you know, little cross-hatched timber houses. Um, you know, beautiful cathedrals. It's, it's gorgeous. And uh, a branch of the Loire River runs right through there. It's a lovely place if you like being outdoors, if you like walking, if you like um, history. So we spent three weeks there because that's where my husband was teaching on a study abroad program. Um, he had a group of American students from his university that he was teaching an ethics class to. And so part of the fun of it for, for us was that we got to go on the field trips with them. So we went to uh, the Cointreau distillery. <laughs> I thought that was so funny that that was one of the field trips, but it's in Angers. Um, and that's one of the video postcards that I posted. Um, we went to Mont Saint-Michel, which is a beautiful uh, old monastery that is, uh, it's, it's on an island, basically, just off the, the Normandy coast. And, um, and speaking of Normandy, we also went on a field trip to uh, the D-Day beaches, which was just surreal. I mean, so my son is nine. Well, he was nine at the time. He's now 10. And, you know, he doesn't, they've not really studied World War II at all yet. So we watched a, a documentary about D-Day so that he could have some sense of, you know, why we're walking around cemeteries and, you know, what is this all about? And, um, and the, the documentary was really good. It had some cool kind of CGI recreations of the, the experience of landing on Omaha Beach. And um, so to watch, we watched that the night before and then got on the bus with the students and rode up, up there the next day. And it was a beautiful, beautiful day. Sunshine, um, not too hot, but, you know, warm enough that you could put your toes in the ocean. The beach is gorgeous. Uh, and it's just so odd, you know, to, I mean, I had this weird feeling of, did you ever, did you ever read Madeline Langle's Wrinkle in Time, that bit where um, they're talking about time travel as a tesseract and, she, and uh, is it Mrs. Mrs. What's it, I think, folds up her skirt to sort of show how, um, and then a little ant crawls across it to show how you could, you know, kind of fold up time to travel across it in a short instant. I kind of felt like that was what it was like being on this beach, you know, that I could simultaneously see this beautiful, tranquil beach at the same time that there's this kind of film of men, you know, pouring onto the beach, dying by the, by the hundreds. Um, it was, it was very, very odd. And right as I was having that experience, this guy rode by in a one horse buggy. <laughs> it was just, and then this group of French school children, about 30 of them, all about eight or nine years old, um, stormed the beach. Like they all went down by the water and then on the count of three, count of trois, went racing up the beach, screaming as if they were in the middle of Braveheart. <laughs> so, so odd. Uh, so yeah, the, the field trips were, that was really fun to be able to do that kind of stuff with them. And Angers itself was just amazing. Um, great farmer's market because the Loire Valley is a big agricultural region. Um, and really interesting to see which kinds of fruits and vegetables are, you know, considered exotic and expensive and which ones are very affordable, like apples were kind of expensive, whereas um, the cherries were ridiculously cheap. So yeah, just interesting, you know, kind of adjusting to 
the and meat was incredibly expensive so we didn't eat that much of it while we were there um yeah so just kind of interesting adjusting to different food realities i guess uh, the funniest thing that happened while we were there <laughs> and i still can't believe this happened is that um so the chateau in Angers, like I said, it was built in the 14th century. It's uh, it's a very imposing Gothic-looking fortress-style chateau. It's not not one of these elegant Renaissance-style ones. It's like it's meant to guard the city, and um, so it's built out of stone. It's very dark stone. It just like you look at it and you think there is no way anybody's getting in that thing. So we went there a, a number of times because it was just really interesting. And and one of the uh, I have a video postcard about the Chateau, too, actually. One of the really interesting things about it is that it has this tapestry in it from, I believe, the 15th century, if I'm remembering, remembering correctly. And uh, it originally was hundreds of meters long, uh, this woven tapestry that depicts the scenes from the apocalypse. And uh, and just just a masterpiece of, of uh, weaving skill. And there's another whole museum in Angers that is has a modern tapestry, like a 1950s and 60s tapestry that is a kind of a, a post-war response to that apocalypse tapestry. So, you know, a really weaving rich area of France. Um, okay, so but that's not the weird part. So the Chateau had a uh, English language day that the English language library in Angers had organized. So I guess some American expat had started an English language library in the town. And they hold events every week, including a knitting circle, which unfortunately I never got to go to. Uh, but they have all these events that are designed to help French people practice their English. And, uh, and so this is an annual event that they hold at the Chateau to, uh, you know, just kind of gather people together, encourage them to speak English, uh, expose them to American and British culture, mostly British culture, and uh, so they had, my husband volunteered us to basically help out at the event. So we helped them do things like set up the, the badminton court and the cricket game. <laughs> and they had, uh, this is really nice, they had some lawn chairs set up with uh, some English language, like classic English language literature kind of arranged so that you could sit down and read Poe or Shakespeare or whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they asked, so when we signed up, uh, the organizer saw that there was a, a mom and a kid coming, and she said, oh, we're doing a, a kid's performance of Where the Wild Things Are. Do you think that you and your son could play Max and his mom? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can. So my son and I... <laughs> Uh, in the sh in the chapel, like you know, that the the Duke of Anjou used to use to pray, uh, performed where the wild things are for all the kids and their families, and the kids played the monsters, which was hilarious. Um, somebody had made all these really cute little felt and yarn monster masks that looked just like the monsters in Where the Wild Things Are, and Liam had the you know the uh, wolf suit hood on. They had a whole outfit, but it was meant designed for a four-year-old, not a nine-year-old. So he did. He just wore the hood, and uh, and we acted out the whole book. And the get this, okay? So weird enough that I'm performing where the wild things are in a 14th-century ch chapel in France for a group of school children and their parents. But guess who was in the audience? Guess. You'll never guess. Jude Law's parents. <laughs> yes, Jude Law's parents. Why? Because Jude Law's parents have a summer home in Angers, and his dad was doing a like a kind of performative reading of some English language materials at the English Language Day at the, at the Chateau, and he just thought it would be a lark to go see this little performance of Where the Wild Things Are. I actually got to talk to them. <laughs> they, 
they introduced me to them. I was, you know, I'm a bit all casual, like, hey, how's it going? And, uh, and I said, you're about to see about five of my 15 minutes of fame. And he said, I am so glad I was here for this. Boom. What? It's amazing I haven't gotten a call from Hollywood agent by now, because let me tell you, it was a brilliant performance. <laughs> I can't even say that with a straight face. It was terrible. But uh, boy, it was fun. So yeah, just super good times in Angers. And uh, so that was our first three weeks. And then we spent a week and a half in Tuscany with my parents who had rented a villa there, you know, as you do. But they knew if they rented a big place that people would come and share it with them, and they did. So it was, it was me and my sister and her husband and my family, of course, and my dad's youngest brother and his wife and two of my parents' best friends. We all crammed into this lovely little villa and really didn't do that much. I mean, we kind of visited some hill towns, but honestly, it was a beautiful villa overlooking olive orchards. Why go anywhere? It was so relaxing. Uh, and then we spent four days in Paris and then we came home. And I, could, I mean, I could go on and on and on about this trip, but the last thing I will say about it for now is that if you ever, ever get the chance to go to Paris on Bastille Day, go and bother to get down to see the Eiffel Tower, the fireworks that uh, are at the Eiffel Tower on Bastille Day. Holy guacamole. They are the, the most amazing fireworks I have ever, 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 ever seen. Uh, they actually fire them off of the Eiffel Tower, so it becomes part of this... It, be, it becomes part of the show, the, the tower itself. And, uh, and they have speakers set up in all the places that they would expect people to go and watch, you know, that have a good sight line to the tower. Uh, they have speakers set up so that you can hear this musical soundtrack that goes along with the fireworks. It was stunning. I mean, I was, I was weeping for about half of it. It was absolutely terrible getting back home after that because the metro was crowded with crazy people. My son actually started crying because it was kind of freaking him out. He's not a big city boy. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure he'd be really glad I just told you that. <laughs> he was great. He, he bit off everything that trip had to offer. He was speaking French. He was going off by himself and ordering pastries in the morning. He was riding his bike around. He was eating escargot. He just had the most amazing time. And uh, yeah, I just love that kid. He's so, he just, he's, he's great, great fun. All right, so yeah, it was a great trip and uh, because this is a knitting show, I will now kind of tie this back into <laughs> to something to do with knitting. Um, I So I, I mentioned before I left that I really wanted to see what, see if I could find out something about what knitting culture is like in, particularly in France, but um, in Italy as well. Honestly, the entire time I was there, I saw not a single person knitting other than my mother. Um, it doesn't seem to be as much of a thing. Although I did, as I did mention, there was a, there is a knitting circle in Angers, but it's at the English language library. But clearly, people knit. I get the sense that knitting is still something that people learn in school, or at least until somewhat recently was something that people learned in school, but is treated as relatively utilitarian. Um, evidence to this point. I went to a couple of the yarn stores in Angers and, or in that area, I guess. And it was a lot of, you know, kind of Sirdar acrylic blends, which, okay. But, you know, I, I, let's just put it this way. I didn't do any yarn acquisition while I was there. Uh, so that was a little disappointing. I have a feeling it's it's just it, it hasn't had that kind of 
hip DIY cool cultural comeback that it has in the US and to a certain extent in the UK. Um, <clears throat> I may be wrong about that. If you know more about this and want to correct me, please do. Um, so that was that was interesting. Uh, I did, on, on kind of a more positive note, um, I did find a lot of inspiration there. I, as I may have mentioned, I do a lot of designing for men and boys, and particularly in terms of menswear, you know, European men tend to have slightly more adventuresome tastes when it comes to clothing. Um, some of you may think of that as an understatement, but I, I, I say that with some modification, modification for a reason. Um, I don't think Italian or French men dress in really kooky, in, any, in anything that might be considered kooky by an American man, by most American men. Uh, but they do wear more bright colors. So, uh, for instance, I saw a lot of French and Italian men wearing, say, salmon-colored pants or Kelly green pants, you know, much, much more bright color on their clothing and particularly on their pants. Uh, much more fashionable shoes, of course. I mean, I saw a lot of guys in sneakers too, but well, no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't see a lot of guys in sneakers. Um, a lot of athletic wear, I guess I should say, but you know, kind of a little bit more fashionable, but it kind of inspired me to get back into designing for men again, because I've kind of, I've not done as much of it lately. And I think I really want to design for that kind of guy, you know? I mean, I, I do design some stuff that m most American men would wear, but I just, I really like the more, not necessarily high fashion stuff, but something that's a little more chic, uh, that's a little more fitted, that's a little more colorful, that, um, uh, you know, just has some design to it. So I took a lot of pictures while I was there, particularly of, of colors, color combinations, not just, not really of other people's clothing, but uh, when I was at Mont Saint Michel, for instance, there was this, the combination of, there was this really yellowy orange moss on the gray stone that was just beautiful. So, and, and some uh, stained glass windows that looked like they were cables. So I'm actually thinking about doing a line of sweaters that are inspired by uh, French and Italian architecture. We shall see. News coming up. So I did, that was, um, that kind of reinvigoration of my interest in men's design was, was really great. And, um, and it was just, it was honestly, it was just inspiring to, and you've probably had this happen before, if you've, you know, taken a, just a, a you know, big trip somewhere. It doesn't even have to be out of the country necessarily, but just to kind of get out of your usual context for a while. Sometimes it doesn't even require leaving your city. But just, you know, to kind of not do the same thing day after day and really kind of get some distance from what you've been doing was really, really helpful to me. And um, it made me decide to take some more time for my own projects. I've been doing a lot of work for other people and I've decided to devote, really make a concerted effort to devote more time to my own design. So I was grateful to the trip for that too, um, just to you know kind of look out for my own creative interests a little more. Um, speaking of which, I, so when I came home, you know, after spending five weeks basically of not working. It's not entirely true. I did work some while I was there, but not that much. <clears throat> I was really invigorated to get, kind of get back to my work. And, um, and so I started, right before I left, the illustrator for my Kung Fu Knits book uh, sent me all, finally sent me all of the drawings for the book. <laughs> so when I got back, I, I, uh, really jumped into getting it all laid out. I am so, so excited about this book. Um, I'll kind of give you some more details as things go along, but basically the idea is that the, the kind of core notion, it, it's a collection of boys' uh, designs. Girls could wear them, but it's, you know, kind of targeted at boys. Um, 
ages 4 to 12. The idea is, it, or the kind of kernel notion, is that it can be really hard to get boys to wear knitted stuff. And it can be really frustrating, you know, to make them something, and not only are they going to grow out of it fast, but they might not ever wear it. They're just not that into clothes, they're not that into fashion, usually. Um, they're just hard to knit for, right? So the collection, it's called Kung Fu Knits, it's a co combined comic book and pattern collection. So the comic book tells the story about a little boy, well a boy, grade school age boy, who wants to go outside in the winter and his mom's telling him to put on warm clothing and he's like, no, <laughs> yeah, I'm not even cold. You know, he's like in shorts and a t-shirt. And, uh, and so she has knitted him all these cool kung fu stuff, like a sweater and pants and a belt, like a whole kung fu outfit. And then um, knitted nunchucks and throwing stars. And when he puts it all on, he's able to go outside and, and in his imagination, kind of Calvin and Hobbes style. In his imagination, he's tackling all of these winter demons outside with all this stuff. Um, so the whole story is about like, Yes, you can get boys to wear knitted things if you make them the right things and if you tell them the story in the right way. So the comic book is supposed to appeal to the kid and the adult too. Um, and the pattern collection comes at the end. So the last piece I've been waiting on, honestly, for about a year and a half. Mmm, want to strangle that illustrator. But anyway, he did a great job. So he did the comic book part. I wrote the story, but he did the drawings. And uh, that's finally in. So we are pretty much ready to go. I'm planning on a 1st of September release date, and uh, I can't wait for you to see it. I'll start posting some uh, teaser stuff very soon. So I've got all the photos and got everything ready to go. Um, so that is super exciting, and I have some other exciting design projects in the works that I can't really it's always so frustrating you know especially with a video podcast like guess what I have cool things coming up can't show you can't tell you about it that makes some really scintillating viewing for you doesn't it <laughs> <clears throat> here are things that I can tell you about number one there are things that are done and they're out that I made myself I told you about the Jacob Marisbeth hat this cool little cable hat. So that is, uh, that just came out, I had released it as an individual pattern, but it's also now in uh, Knit Edge magazine through Cooperative Press. And there's a really, uh, if you like knitting themed stories, they're the same author who inspired, whose story inspired this hat, has written a knitting themed short story that appears in that same issue of Knit Edge magazine. So. You should check it out. It's a really good story. Um, I also, this you have not seen, the thing that is hovering behind me. This is the Arezzo tank. Arezzo is uh, the town that we were staying near in Italy. Um, I designed this with a new yarn from Knit Picks uh, called Lindy Chain, which is a linen cotton blend that I really, really like. It's constructed in such a way that it doesn't droop as in the same way that a lot of uh, plant fiber yarns do. Um, so the tank comes in a ton of sizes. It's uh, extra small up to, I believe, 2XL. You'd think I'd remember being my own pattern, but I would actually have to look that up. <laughs> I wrote a lot of sizes. And um, it's fun the way it's constructed. You basically start with the two straps. Back. Two straps. There we go. Two straps. Um, you start by doing those and then you uh, kind of connect. It's worked from the top down. You connect them all together and work them down. Uh, and this uh, lace pattern travels down the front and the back of the tank top. I'll show you the, the back as well. And it's got some, some waist shaping and uh, the the way that the lace stretches out it basically provides some uh, naturally provides some hip shaping so and actually there's a little bit of bust shaping in there too if you need it all optional or the, the bust shaping is optional um 
So if you don't need it, you can leave it out. And I tell you how to create more if you need to. So it's very adjustable. And um, you would have to wear a camisole underneath it because it's uh, this is a drop stitch pattern that you can you can see through. Um, well, I suppose you don't have to wear a camisole underneath it. It's entirely up to you. I would, you know, most people would. Uh, so that pattern is, um, it's available both through me and through Knit Picks. It's called the Arezzo Tank. It's A-R-E-Z-Z-O. And I'm pretty happy about that one. Uh, I haven't ever designed with, have I? No, I haven't ever, ever designed a uh, plant fiber piece before. So I was really happy with how this came out. Um, what am I working on now? I'm, I'm actually... I've kind of finished a bunch of stuff up because I took some things with me to, uh, on, on the trip and now I'm kind of like, I need to start some new projects. Nice position to be in. Um, I finished, well, I've mostly finished this. This is something I've been working on oh, since October of last year. I looked, looked it up today when I was putting some notes on Ravelry. Uh, the Enchanted Shrug by Grace McEwen. I'm probably a little tired of seeing this by now. What I haven't done yet is, um, I've done knitting it. I haven't seamed, I haven't blocked it and I haven't seamed the sleeves yet. So what you're supposed to do is this, you know, goes around your back and this, you know, once it gets really blocked out becomes the sleeve and you just kind of sew it up to here and you do the same thing on the other side and leave this part open so it just stretches across your back. Um, kind of a typical shrug design. And uh, the lace pattern is lovely. Although I have to say, this is such a nitpicky little thing, but it really irritated me. Um, the way that this particular designer did the lace pattern, she has, let's see if I can show this to you, on the, is it the downward facing? Whatever direction you knit these in. There's a, there's a row of, there are three rows of holes. And then on the upward facing ones, there are only two. It's just like, why? <laughs> I'm all for asymmetry, but I don't think that was really on purpose. Uh, she used make ones at a critical point instead of yarn overs. Just, I don't know, just a little irritating. But I really like how, uh, how it looks in this yarn. Um, the lace pattern, I was worried it was going to get a little lost, but I don't think it does. And I think once it's blocked, it will really show off the lace pattern. It's supposed to be blocked pretty aggressively. Um, so it will be quite stretched out, sort of like that. So next time I talk to you, I will probably have this all blocked and, and seamed up so I can show it to you. So that is done. And that was a lot of netting, boy. It was uh, lace, Pandia's, what is it? Pandia's Jewels, Wispy, in the Woodland Magic colorway. 875 yards. I used up pretty much every last bit of it. This is, this little dongle here is the last of it. Um, I knitted on size fives. And yeah, it just took... It was a lot of, it was basically a 20 row over and over and over and over and over, 18 rows over and over and over again. A little, a little repetitive. I think next time I do lace, I'll do something that changes up a little more often. Um, what else do I, have I been working on? Um, oh, I just, I just read a really good book that I wanted to tell you a little about, uh, Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern. It's been out for several years, so it's hardly news in the sense, but um, it's a book about, oh, it's wonderful. Such a good book. I didn't really like the ending. I thought it was a little bit cliched, maybe? Yeah, it was a little cliched. Uh, but the book was beautiful. It's about a circus that gets built up, it's kind of this hypnotic, bizarre nighttime circus that evolves out of a magic contest between a young man and a young woman. 
Um, and there's a romantic relationship between them that develops. It's not really a spoiler. It's hardly surprising that that happens. Um, and there are two older men who are sort of behind the whole contest. And it's, it's just one of these hypnotically written books. It's, it's hard to describe. The language is really lovely. The, the descriptions of, did you ever see, oh my gosh, what was that TV series about the circus in the twenties and thirties that was on Carnival on HBO years ago and it got canceled and I was like, oh, it was like almost as bad as Firefly getting canceled. Um, Carnival, oh my God. It's like if Carnival were set in, where is it set? This is set in Europe. It's like a Carnival were set in Europe. It's got that same kind of really, really rich context to it. Beautiful book. Uh, so definitely um, recommend that. And I think, I do believe that is all I have to say about re-entry and inspiration and that whole theme. I was thinking about, you know, what technique do I want to talk about today that uh, has to do with re-entry. And I thought I would talk about something that uh, often dogs people, which is picking up stitches somewhat loose interpretation of the notion of re-entry. Um, I guess, you know, sort of re-entering into stitches that you've already made. So a lot of times in patterns, like let's say a, a typical time when you might be picking up stitches is if you've made a sweater and now you have to pick up a button band by, you've kind of seamed the whole sweater together, or maybe it was all done one piece, and now you have to pick up stitches all around the, up the sides and around the collar and back down again. And usually, I mean, kind of the standard pattern writing techniques tell you exactly how many stitches to pick up. And sometimes they'll even break it down by, you know, this many stitches on the right front and then this many stitches around the left side of the collar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the problem with that is that your row gauge, even if you've gotten exactly the same stitch gauge as the, uh, as the pattern calls for, your row gauge is probably different, even if you've used the same yarn. So um, the stitch count that they give for how many stitches to pick up may not be quite accurate. And furthermore, who really wants to count how to pick up 80 stitches or 150 stitches or whatever across the front band? Like, that's just annoying. So here's, here's a trick. Um, even if your instructions tell you to say, tell you to do that, you can in, instead pick up as many stitches as you want with a caveat that I will get to in a minute. Um, but here's how you do it. The way you know how many stitches to pick up is to measure your gauge. So measure your stitch gauge, how many stitches per inch you're getting, and be sure to do it over four, at, le at least four inches, maybe six, how many stitches per inch you're getting. And, um, and also measure your row gauge. How many rows per inch are you getting? Now, let's say, here's a typical worsted weight gauge, for instance, that you're getting 20 stitches over four inches, five stitches per inch, and um, 24 rows over four inches, six rows per inch. What you do, so let's say you're picking up stitches along the, the right front, for instance. You notice what you're doing is, you're picking up stitches along a vertical, uh, along a vertical line. So you're picking up stitches along rows. So if you think about that ratio, five stitches per inch to six rows per inch, pick up five stitches for every six rows, and you will get a nice flat piece of knitting. You'll, get, you'll have picked up just the right amount so that your, your button band lies nice and flat. If you had a ratio that was closer to, say, four to five, pick up four stitches for every five. Um, you, can, you can adjust it in that way. You can actually pick up even fewer, usually. Um, but that gives you a really good, accurate sense of how many stitches to, to pick up. Now, once you get, let's say, when you get to a horizontal area, like say the back of the neck, you're picking up 
stitch for stitch. So do one, pick up one stitch for every stitch that's bound off back there because you're moving along a horizontal seam. But when you're moving along vertical or uh, diagonal seams, pick up stitches in the same ratio as stitch gauge to row gauge, and it'll work perfectly every time. One of my favorite tips. So, um, and I wanted to say too, I've been so happy that uh, some of my technique videos are really working out for people. I've, I've seen a number of people comment on Ravelry, for instance, that my tip from a number of episodes back about uh, Judy's, not Judy's Magic Cast on, Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off, the tip that I gave about uh, doing it very tightly, that particular bind off, um, a number of people have said that they've used that and it's really helped them, which that is fabulous. Makes me very happy to hear that. So, uh, yeah, makes it worthwhile to think through, you know, what I might, what I might say for the week. Okay. I have been talking for 40 minutes straight, so I think it's time for me to go, but I will, I'm back on a regular every two weeks recording schedule now. So, uh, I will see you again in a couple of weeks. And in the meantime, Take care.